James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress. Katie Davis Majors did just that. As a late teenager, she went to Uganda on a missions trip and ended up going back to adopt 13 Ugandan young ladies and became their mother. She's moved there from Nashville and she demonstrates what heroic faith looks like and also what pure religion looks like as well. This is a great story of courage. You're going to be impacted by it. Enjoy. In the midst of pain and suffering, even those with deep faith find themselves asking questions and wondering why. Here's Katie Davis Majors. We know we're supposed to say God is in control, God's plan is better, but what about when we are not feeling that? What about when we are not seeing that? And I think another thing God really showed me was that He hurts when I hurt. He He desires to comfort me because He understands my pain. This is Family Life Today. Our host is Dennis Rainey, and I'm Bob Lapine. We'll hear from Katie Davis Majors today about how Jesus becomes real when we walk through the valley of the shadow. Stay with us. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. we got a hero back in the studio with us today. We do, and uh, I don't think we've ever ever had a guest introduced by their 14-year-old daughter. (laughs) But that's what we're going to do here on the broadcast. But I, first of all, want to welcome back Katie Davis, now Majors. Huh? I got that right? Katie Davis Majors, married now for how many years? Almost three. Almost three. You'll hear more about that in a moment. But my wife, Barbara, also joins us uh, on the broadcast. Welcome back, sweetheart. Thanks. It's a delight to be here. We were just in uh, Bismarck over the weekend, met a ton of radio listeners, Bob, uh, some great people there. I'll talk about that maybe on a later broadcast, but uh, Katie has written a book called Daring to Hope. Many of you probably heard about Katie about a decade ago when she wrote a New York Times bestseller, Kisses from Katie, and uh, it's a story about her adopting a few Ugandan young ladies, and one of those young ladies wrote the afterword for your book. I'm not going to read it all. It's okay. it, it's really not fair that I don't read it all. But her name is Joyce. She's 14. And here's what she said about her mom. Katie Majors is my mother. No mother is as brilliant, gorgeous, talented, <laughs> and fabulous sweet. as my sweet, awesome mother. You have really got her snow, don't you? <laughs> That's not what you say in your book. You talk about losing your temper and getting impatient. But uh, somehow, she didn't ever see any of those moments, I guess, huh? She's gracious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to read all the way down to the end because she talks about how you're the best cook, how you got the best heart, mm-hmm. how she sees you caring for people. But she concludes by saying this, I pray for my mom each day that God would continue to bless her life and use her to do incredible things. I love my mother because she brings glory to God, not only through her gifts, but also by calling out gifts and talents in others, including me. She speaks to us that we too can be used by God, and He works through her to shine His light into the hearts of many. I admire my mother. And I pray that I, too, can live a life like hers, serving others first before myself. No matter what my mother goes through, she will tell you that it is okay because God has always been with her. She teaches me that I can trust Him to be with me, too. Joyce Liberty Majors age 14. And a lot of listeners are going, how do you get a 14-year-old to say things like that about your mother? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to make me cry at the beginning of this interview. Where did you find Joyce? Uh, Joyce came to me when she was 
about five and a half. And she had lost both of her parents in the war in northern Uganda and had been shuffled around since then in some pretty dangerous situations when she was brought to me. She is one now of how many that you have uh, become mom to? She's one of 14 kids, 13 through adoption, and one that we just gave birth to about a year and a half ago. And there's a new dimension to your life that I hinted at earlier, uh, the second love of your life, God yes. being the first, Yes, Benji. Tell us about Benji. Benji. So Benji moved to Uganda about seven years ago. He was really, he had come on a short-term trip to volunteer at a special needs orphanage, but he was really burdened that there were a lot of ministries pouring into women and a lot of ministries really helping out children and not a lot of ministries pouring into men and discipling them and teaching them to be good fathers and good husbands. And so he came back full time just to disciple men and to encourage them in their roles as husband, father, provider for the family. And so he has been doing that now for about seven years. We met when he first came to Uganda. Okay, I'm going to stop you there because we're going to tell more of this story (laughs) on on a later broadcast. (laughs) But you have to, you have to confess, you turned him down. Yes, the first two times he asked you out. That is true. Why? You know, I don't think it was about him personally as much as it was just about where I was at the time. I think I had really decided. As, as much as marriage sounded like a wonderful and beautiful thing, I think I had decided that's probably not in the cards for me. I have, you know, a huge ministry. I have this huge family. We live in kind of an unusual way with all these people in and out of our home. I just, I didn't think that God would bring someone with a heart who could really take all that on. And I think um, I'm, I'm stubborn. And I'm, I'm, and you found out even now how much more stubborn you were than you thought when you realized it back then, right? Exactly. And I, you know, I, I had been fairly independent for a long time, so the idea of leadership to me was a, a little scary, honestly. And I think that is, I mean, that's really how the Lord confirmed for me that Benji and I were to get married because he was the first, the first person in my life that I really felt like not only did I want to make decisions with him. But before I made any decision, I wanted to ask him what he thought. I saw in him so much wisdom and just that he was chasing after the Lord. And for the first time ever, it was my desire to really follow. And Bob, she really uh, embodies uh, some advice that you've given listeners over the years who are single about how to select the right person. Uh, to spend the rest of your life with? Well, it wasn't it wasn't something original with me. I, th- I think I heard Pastor Tommy Nelson in Denton, Texas say, if you're single, run as hard and as fast toward Jesus as mm-hmm. you can. And if you're running out of the corner of your eye, you see somebody running in the same direction at the same speed, take a second look. Absolutely. Benji was running in the same direction mm-hmm. at the same speed, maybe even a little faster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, your book begins in your kitchen. Mm-hmm. It's a place where relationships are made, mm-hmm. miracles occur. And I love it because you you must have a little bit of a perfectionist in you because you talk about mud and red dirt and footprints in the first couple of pages of your book that uh, all 14 of these children that you've adopted have to track in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen, and the kitchen is not very clean a lot of the time. You know, it's... It's amazing how that can happen. It's perfectly pristine before we go to bed, and then 6 o'clock in the morning rolls around, and somehow it's in disarray again. That sounds like most kitchens (laughs) for most women, because when I started reading that, I thought, oh, that sounds like my kitchen. (laughs) It was always sticky on the floor and crumbs everywhere. It was. It's just a part of having a family and having kids. Life does happen in the kitchen. Yes. Your, uh, your book, Daring to Hope, I told Bob before uh, you came into the studio, I said, this is really a book that could be titled Reality Check, <laughs> because the reality that mm. you have faced in Uganda over the last decade has really grown you up yeah. in a lot of ways spiritually. Comment on that, if you would. Yeah, it absolutely has. I mean, I think in Uganda, suffering is so in your face, but... Really, that's world over, right? You can't even turn on the news without seeing some terrible tragedy. And I think anybody who 
can really truly say that they believe in a good and loving father has had to ask the question, okay, are you really good and are you really loving? And mm -hmm. if, if you really are good and loving, why is all this going on around me? And so Daring to Hope really is kind of the chronicle of my journey through some of those questions. Yeah, and I would say if there's a listener right now who's going through a hard time mm -hmm. and um, you're kind of kind of confused, you're, you're maybe disappointed, discouraged, I think uh, Daring to Hope would be a great book to pick up and read because it's going to pull you out of your valley and remind you of the truth about God. And that's really the message of Katie's book. She just wants people to know the truth about God so as they face their reality— they will be able to trust him as well. Well, thank you. I, I really did write it to encourage people that no matter what they're going through, you know, it probably looks a lot different than what I was going through in Uganda, but in the midst of pain and hardship and trial, I knew Jesus in a way that I wouldn't have known him outside of those circumstances. And I believe that that's his desire for all of us, no matter what our hardship is, just that we would know his comfort, and we would know that we are so deeply loved. The last time you were with us, you shared about how, as a teenager, God gave you a, a heart and a vision for Uganda. You went there at 19 to care for orphans, and you started caring for them, and you started bringing them home, and you started adopting them. And before you were married, you were already a mother to, how many was it? Thirteen. Thirteen kids. So you haven't adopted any new ones since marriage. No. We had all 13 of our girls before we got married. And have you thought about expanding since you've been married? You've obviously expanded because you've got a new baby <laughs> in the house. Have you thought about additional adoptions? Or is 13 where it ends? Well, I mean— I think we're really open to however the Lord leads. If if he would make a need very apparent, then we would definitely be open to it. I think we've seen more and more over the years the beauty of empowering local people to adopt. And we've seen local people become more and more open to the idea of adopting. So my 13 girls were all situations where through our ministry, we sponsor children. So we send them to school. We pay for some of their food. We do a discipleship program with them, all in the hopes of keeping them with their biological family. Because most biological families really do want their kids. It's just such a financial burden for them that they, they give them up. And so our, our ministry is really geared toward empowering the family to care for their own children. And my 13 are all groups of siblings that were older and for whatever reason just either didn't have biological family they could be placed with or it, it wasn't a safe situation for them. But in the last probably seven years, we've had several more instances where that's happened with children that we're in relationship with through ministry. Maybe both their parents have died, or maybe they're already staying with a grandparent and the grandparent has died. And we've actually had a lot of Ugandan staff mm -hmm. in our ministry say, oh, I could open my home to that child, especially because Amazima is covering some of the basics like medical care or schooling. The Ugandan culture is beautifully hospitable and relational. And so we've just seen so much openness from, from our staff and other Ugandans we're in relationship with to adopt. So I think for us, it's really on our heart that we would first we would first always seek out biological family, but then even beyond that, we would seek out if there was a Ugandan family in our community that would desire to adopt that child. Mm. You, um, you've, you've been foster care parents yeah. for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why is the HIV AIDS virus that has taken out so many people's lives yes. in Uganda. I don't think people in America realize what this disease is doing to the populations of many African countries. When I was in South Africa mm -hmm. a number of years ago, we flew over a graveyard. And usually graveyards will have, you know, if it's a big graveyard, it'll have two or three or four freshly dug graves. But the, the graveyards that we flew over in South Africa, over 50% were brand new. Tell us what you're wow. seeing of what that that disease is doing in Uganda, and and then tell tell about the the little girl by the name of Jane who came to you because of that disease. 
You're right. HIV AIDS is taking a lot of lives in Uganda. Thankfully, even just in the 10 years that I've lived there, treatment has become more and more accessible, which is great. But sometimes people don't even really know that they're sick for a long period of time. And I even talk about in the book some of the people that we've cared for with HIV AIDS that have gotten on medication a bit later in life. And then it can be very hard. We have a lot of children in our program who have lost one parent or both parents to that disease. And we put a big focus on education, but also on helping people get into the right system so they can be on their medication. Because also what people in Uganda aren't super educated about is the fact that once you're on medication, it's not a death sentence. You can live a healthy life, but what they see in their faces day in and day out is that this disease kills people. And so when people find out that they're sick, they almost completely lose hope because they don't understand that they could get on medication and live a fairly normal life. You've dealt with a lot of those that you've cared for, including the parents of those you've cared for uh, who have died from AIDS. I especially like the story of the little girl named Jane. Would you mind sharing that with, with our listeners? Sure. So Jane is a child we fostered, but we fostered her long term. And we've had other short term foster children in and out of our home over the years. But we've always known that they were a short term placement and that our goal was reunification with family with Jane. We didn't believe that that was our goal. Jane had been abandoned when she was about nine months old and brought to me when she was around one. We searched and we looked for her biological family. We sent out radio, newspaper advertisements, and we didn't find any family that was willing to care for her. So I began fostering her and began the process to make her adoption legal as well. We had her for about three years when her biological mom came back in the country from Kenya tracked us down and really just showed up and said that she desired to parent Jane. And so my, I mean, my heart was just torn in two because Mm -hmm. my life's ministry was about empowering the family. And at the same time, I felt like this was my daughter. I was the only mother she had ever known since I'd had her from the time she was a little baby. She was a sister to my daughters. This was really not something that we had expected or seen coming. And that's kind of one of the first stories in the book where I I begin kind of asking God, okay, when I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying for something specific, such as Jane to come back and live with us, and that doesn't happen, where are you then, God? Or if I think I know what's best for me, for my family, for this child who is now confused and traumatized, and I think I know what would be good for her. You know, how do I trust that no, truly God knows what's best for each one of us involved? And uh, Jane's mom was not skilled as a parent, and you could easily spot that. So you knew that you were handing her back over to her biological mom to be raised in certainly a less than perfect situation. Yeah, it was very scary. Um, Her mom didn't have a great track record, and she went to live there for a little while, and then they actually ended up coming to stay with us for a while while her mom was between jobs. And I feel like we were able to pour into both of them for a while, and then her mom got another job and was able to move out for a while. But since then, they lived near us for a long time, and since then, they have moved away. So we don't even really have a ton of contact with them anymore. You know, that... That question that you found yourself wrestling with is a question that we all wrestle with in life. And I remember back when the shooting in Las Vegas happened Mm -hmm. in the United States, and um, I I wrote an article about how do we process this kind of disaster? How do we help our kids understand it? And I said, you got to remind yourself of what's true, that God is in control, that he's sovereign. I, I kind of rehearsed what we all know is true. Right. And I remember somebody commenting at the bottom of the article with, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Huh. And and I, I, I get it. Right. I, I, I get that sure. that is a less than satisfying answer mm-hmm. in the midst of the pain. But I don't know a better answer to that. Do you? I don't. And I I know um, 
you know, as I was I was writing this book, I really I didn't want it to be a bunch of Christian platitudes, right? right? Because right. we know we're supposed to say God is in control, God's plan is better. But what about when we are not feeling that? Mm. What, what about when we are not seeing that? And I think another thing God really showed me was that He hurts when I hurt. He he desires to comfort me because he understands my pain. And it's the same, you know, for for the shooting in Las Vegas, for people who've lost people, it's not that God looks on and says, okay, okay. You know, God is devastated by that suffering. He's deeply grieved and he hurts alongside of us. And I think that gave me even more comfort than knowing that God was in control yeah. and knowing that God had a plan. I was comforted knowing that God saw my hurt. He experienced it with me, and he desired to love me in the midst of it. In Romans chapter 8, where mm-hmm. it talks about the reality of our adoption, that God has adopted us, that we are joint heirs, it goes on to throw this curveball in the middle of talking about all of this blessing. It says, here's what God has given to those he loves. We have his spirit. We're joint heirs. If we suffer with him, Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, why did you have to throw that in there, God? (laughs) Why couldn't it just be, here's what Mm -hmm. you get? But there is a connection between glory Mm -hmm. and suffering that we're averse to, but that is a part of God's plan for us. I absolutely believe that. You know, Paul even says that it has been granted unto me yes. not just to preach the gospel of Christ, but to suffer with him. And I I always read that and think, oh, God, let that be my my perspective on it, that, that it has been granted unto me because through suffering, I might know a part of God's heart that I wouldn't know otherwise. I have a, I have a friend who— um, was in a tragic plane crash. Mm. And um, while he was struggling for his life in the hospital, I performed the the funeral for his five-year-old son. And he made this statement that certainly anyone could make, but a person in his his place, having lost a son, uh, it just becomes really profound. He said, life wouldn't be so difficult if we didn't expect it to be so easy. Hmm. And what your book does is your book really forces us to realize that there are going to be prayers that appear to be unanswered. Mm -hmm. There's going to be brokenness that continues on in our own lives and in the lives we love. But we have to trust the God who is going to be near us. Mm -hmm. And that's really the message of your book, that in the process of struggling over these prayers that appear to be unanswered or have an answer that's a no— You've gotten to know Jesus Christ in a way you couldn't have you couldn't have known him otherwise. Yes, ab- absolutely. I th- I think I've learned that God isn't promising us a world without trouble or without pain or without heartache, but he's he's promising us himself, right? He calls himself Emmanuel, God with us. He's promising to be near to us and and that's the greatest gift. Well, I couldn't agree more because I have learned over the decades of my life that the hard times are the times when I have gotten to know Christ more. And he knows that about us. He knows that if life is easy and it's good and everything works out the way we want it to, we're not going to need him. We won't depend on him. We won't be forced on our face um, to seek him. And so as hard as the hard things are, they're really good things, good that God intends to work in us. And I was just talking to someone last weekend about this, and we were both saying we wouldn't wish what we've been through on anyone, but we wouldn't trade it for Mm. anything because of what we know of him now that we wouldn't have known apart from that experience. That's a part of what I love so much about your book is that it speaks to that, that everyone experiences, and God deals with all of us as individuals, and what he brings in your life is different than what he brings in my life, but it's all for the purpose of knowing him and knowing him as he really is, not as we imagine him to be, and that's such a good thing. I can't imagine a 29-year-old writing this book. That's what I told Bob when we came in the studio. I said, it's because of where Katie's been, Mm -hmm. what she's seen, 
the number of people she's prayed over for healing, for God to rescue them from HIV, AIDS, and God said no Mm -hmm. and took them on to heaven. Mm -hmm. But you have a perspective that you're passing on that I think really, Bob, all of us today in America where we live with so many comforts Mm -hmm. and and we're, we're removed from the slums where Katie has taught a Bible study, we're removed from the graveside. We, we may go to a funeral or two a, a year, but uh, Katie's been to, to a bunch of them over the years, and that's where perspective is. Ecclesiastes says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of pleasure, hmm. because in the end, the living take it to heart. You know, this is a book that reminds us uh, that most of the problems that we're facing are what we call first world problems. And that doesn't mean they're not real and challenging. It just means we have to keep life in perspective and know what really matters. And Katie, you point us to that in your book, Daring to Hope, Finding God's Goodness in the Broken and the Beautiful. We've got copies of the book in our Family Life Today Resource Center. You can order it from us online at familylifetoday.com or call 1-800-FL-TODAY to order. Again, the website is familylifetoday.com or call 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. I have to tell you, we uh, just recently had an opportunity to be in a number of cities with listeners to Family Life Today and had a chance to hear from many of you how God has used this ministry in your life in some significant ways and how he is still at work using the ministry of Family Life Today to help you grow in grace, to provide practical, biblical help and hope to your marriage, your family. It's always encouraging when we get an opportunity to be face-to-face with listeners. And on behalf of the folks we had a chance to meet, I want to thank those of you who are legacy partners and those of you who support this ministry financially. You need to know that your investment in the lives of people all across the country and around the world is paying off. God is using Family Life Today powerfully in the lives of so many people. And it was encouraging for us to see some of that firsthand. I know some of you are thinking about year-end giving, ministries or organizations where you might like to make a year-end financial contribution. And we have a special opportunity for you here at Family Life to be invested in this ministry. There's a matching gift fund that's been made available to us, and it means that your donation here at year-end will be doubled. Our friend Michelle Hill is here with an update on how things are going with the Matching Gift Fund. Hello, Michelle. Hey, Bob. I have some big news about the Matching Fund, and this is breaking for us, so I'm going a little out on a limb here, but Jordan just told me the Matching Fund is going to double, as in over $4 million, and we don't know the exact number because this is happening right as I speak, but more than ever, we'll need every listener to pray, seek God, and give as He directs. And you know, $4 million seems big to me, but Bob, I believe God's generosity is at work here. So I'm asking everyone, please just prayerfully do whatever God calls you to do. And you know what? While you're at it, praise Him for His amazing generosity, because right now we're at $791,000. And it is easy to make an online donation. You can do that at familylifetoday.com, or you can call 1-800-FL-TODAY, or you can mail your donation to Family Life Today at Box 7111, Little Rock, Arkansas. Our zip code is 722 Two, three. We'll look forward to your update again tomorrow, Michelle. I'll be here. And we hope you'll be back with us again tomorrow when Katie Davis Majors will be here. We're continuing to talk about her life in Africa and her life as a newly married adoptive mother of 13 children and a bio mom of a baby boy. Hope you can tune in for that. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch, along with our entire broadcast production team. On behalf of our host, Dennis Rainey, I'm Bob Lapine. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas, a crew ministry. 
Help for today. Hope for tomorrow.